Tonight, we want to introduce you to the youngest chief in the Von Tut Gwich'in First Nations history. At just 34 years old, Dana Tisha Tram rose above addiction and trauma to lead his native tribe in the fight against a major threat facing his people and their way of life. That threat? Climate change. The Buntut Gwich'in First Nation is a First Nation in the northern Yukon in Canada. Its main population center is Old Crow, and the very name means people of the lakes. But warming temperatures is causing the Arctic to shift, putting a pinch on the people and their lives. Dozens of large lakes have disappeared in recent decades. Migration patterns of caribou are changing, and some villages go years without a successful hunt. The drastic decrease of salmon in the lakes has restricted fishing. All that is leading to the First Nation officially declaring a climate change state of emergency. And joining us now on The World Tonight is the young chief, Dana Tisha Tram. And chief, it's good of you to join us this hour. It's such an important story. I would like to begin our conversation with how you convince the Canadian government to respond to a climate change crisis that was threatening your people. It's a really great question and something that we contemplate as a rural First Nation. A bill 150 people 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle and the most northwest settlement in Canada are people who have traditionally been on our lands for over 24,000 years. So when we make these major political movements in the modern day, these harken back to the traditional principles that have guided my people in a seemingly inhospitable environment in the Arctic, one in which we found uh, a balance in which to thrive with our environment. So when we talk about the Paris Accord and these major international machinations towards uh, mitigating the threats of climate change, this is something our people and Indigenous peoples around the world have already been doing since time immemorial. So I think the truth and the merit of our standing through modern agreements with the Canadian government but as well with, in contrast of not just the science, but the climate issues that we're already seeing, really rang a bell that resonated through municipalities, regions, provinces, territories, all the way to the federal government. And, but Chief, this is a, you know, it, it's fascinating that you're able to do this, and, and the Vuntut Gwich'in uh, First Nation tribe there in Canada, uh, you're also in Canada and the United States. It's a wide range of, of uh, location geographically, and it's so important for you to have this because the climate crisis has been encroaching upon your people and actually amounting to an existential uh, threat to your future. Talk to me about the essence of what you have seen fall away from your people in terms of the impact of the climate crisis, such as the uh, the, the, the permafrost uh, sloping off and, and the caribou and uh, the whole situation that's come as a result of climate change. Well, I would like to begin by thanking uh, the current administration of the United States through President Biden, who has a strong partnership with the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, who have signaled a new pathway forward in their collaboration on these important subjects. But I would also like to really address the elephant in the room, if you will, as I've noticed that um, there is a luxury among modern day, uh, especially peoples in the cities who are really insulated and removed from the very real impacts of climate change, a luxury not afforded to my people, who still continue to harvest caribou, moose, animals, we pull salmon from the rivers in our rural community. We have 54,000 square kilometers of traditional territory we still occupy. So our lives are largely dependent on these traditional practices. and. What we are seeing is uh, incredibly stark. And for people who do not have to face these immediate changes, please take it from us that when we see our rivers um, just over this past summer, summer uh, reaching less than 50% of their usual levels, 
over last winter, we had maybe two inches of snow over the winter time. And if you can think about life in the Arctic and thinking there being next to no snow, Oh, it's incredibly, incredibly drastic changes. We're seeing changes in just about everything that you can measure, and not just with scientific instruments, which we are also endeavoring on in partnership with different universities, even NASA um, conducting some studies in our traditional territories, but also to what we're seeing when bird migrations and populations are changing. The frequencies in fires are escalating. Um, we have permafrost letting go, which causes slumping in our land, which is really creating landslides that are occluding our river systems, endangering the very foundation of our ecosystems along the food chains, disrupting a natural balance that we had struck with the lands and the animals. We are a caribou people, and our traditional territory, you are correct, reaches from vast expanses from northeast Alaska into Canada through northern Yukon into the Northwest Territories. And the borders of our nation are actually exactly mirror the migration patterns of the porcupine caribou herd, the last largest land animal migration left on earth, a caribou species of over 220,000 strong that allowed my people to thrive in this area. Now their migration uh, patterns are completely erratic um, and we have seen possible development in their calving grounds, which as advocates of the land and as indigenous peoples, I tell people that we live with the land. We've been taught our way of life and our principles on how our community functions with one another and the land from the land. So for those who have forgotten the language of the plants and the animals, we will speak because the caribou and the lands do not speak in English and they are calling for help. They are calling for our attention and our actions collectively.